today. Uh, my topic is uh, development, development environments for microservices and uh, especially the one that we have built at Smartly. Um, and the goal for us has been basically to um, narrow the gap between a Rails monolith and microservices for the development environment. Because as you grow your number of services, suddenly each manual step starts to add up and to get the full uh, development environment running, you probably need to go through 30 different step if you, steps if you have 30 different services. And uh, especially for our case, we figured out that it's a bad idea to store secrets in Git repositories, so then many of them are suddenly needed to copy some passwords or uh, uh, API tokens from our one password vault to uh, configuration files so that you could run the uh, service which was not ideal and it also meant that not many developers actually went through that hustle and they just had uh, the one services running that they needed for their own environment and everything else was left out so that uh, add, uh, adds an extra uh, step to do if you then want to contribute to some other parts of the system or you need to perhaps investigate how something works there. And where we started from was, or historically the first thing we made was a vagrant based virtual machine um, that was running our PHP monolith and then some Python and even Node.js uh, code and had MongoDB database uh, at one point also Postgres. So it was quite a, a lot of stuff. And it was also quite easy to mess up. So if you, because the virtual machine also contained state, then uh, people were a bit reluctant to uh, provision it from scratch, which was, would get you in a consistent state. So you might run some random commands on, on that machine, which then means that you are in a ever so slightly state from what is what you're supposed to be in and you run into weird random errors. Um, when we started our journey into more microservices we also started using Docker Compose as a separate environment or basically each service has their, had their own Docker Compose definition for the service itself, the databases it needed and so on. Uh, which is quite good, except that there was one caveat in our case that suddenly you had to be running two different Linux virtual machines on your laptop to run the smart development environment. So uh, with the default settings, you were using like six gigabytes of RAM, but I also heard that some teams uh, bumped the limit in uh, or the available memory in Docker so that their stuff would uh, run faster to four gigabytes. So that was then consuming in total eight gigabytes of the probably 16 gigabytes available at that, that time because you couldn't buy a Mac laptop with more memory. Uh, so that's fairly annoying. Uh, and then Chrome probably consumes all the rest you have. Uh, <laughs> uh, and your machine is slower than it should be. Um, so we started to look into alternatives. How, how could we like take a next step forward? Of course, we had our own set of goals and constraints, which might be specific to our environment, or perhaps they are not. I'm not sure. But we thought that we would like to run our development environment on a shared Kubernetes cluster, which would be very similar to the one that we are using for production. And that would then mean that we only need to have one set of uh, configuration or, um, well, one set of configuration with some overrides probably for development usage. And uh, we had some overhead in setting up new clusters or we didn't want to run one cluster for each developer but we still wanted to have um, an environment for each developer so that they could work independently for example on database migrations 
uh, we are using multi-repo, so it, each service or project has their own repo, which is different than perhaps some other uh, companies, especially the big ones are using. Um, that's basically just acknowledging the status quo. Our existing tooling is built on that assumption, so our Jenkins uh, is not built so that it would only run uh, tests uh, for the changed parts and recognize which tests need to be run. Uh, our deployment scripts assume that you want to deploy a repo basically. So changing all that would have been quite a distraction. And then we wanted to have the secrets in each repo for the service. Uh, so just so that the teams could work more independently and not have to bug someone with a master key to change them in production. And probably the same solution should also work then for development environment. So basically you could think of um, Rails is encrypted secrets, but something that is more framework independent because we are not just running Rails. We have Node.js and PHP uh, and some others as well uh, running uh, but it can be more Kubernetes specific because that's the only environment that we are thinking that we are going to run in a uh, foreseeable future, uh, at least as we get the older legacy stuff migrated. So uh, to support this, we thought that we would then build a, or well, actually we have built already uh, a command line interface uh, to automate these tasks, which we call DevBox. So we are not very um, good with naming, or uh, at least they are not very imaginative. So you probably can guess what the DevBox does. Uh, of course, this conveniently forgets that probably the biggest uh, thing that we need to do to get this uh, development environment running was to migrate our existing PHP monolith from the Vagrant setup to run on Docker, but I wasn't that involved in that process, plus this is a Ruby meetup, so we can uh, forget about that. Um, and if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, here's my uh, horrible one slide explanation of what it's trying to do. So Kubernetes is a container orchestration system. You might need to know for the next slides that Pod is a group of one or more containers which Kubernetes starts and manages. And containers are something that run Docker images from a registry. Uh, so be, uh, something that's not running on your own machine, at least that's the usual setup. And then Kubernetes can include some custom environment var variables as configuration, or maybe you can choose to use a different entry point than is defined in the Docker image. And then in Kubernetes, there's a load balancer that directs traffic for, uh, that comes into the cluster to a specific pod uh, via services. And you can have basically everything, or, or pods, you can have multiple running at the same time, which are then just copies of, of each other. And this is just simply maybe few hundred to a 1,000 line of YAML configuration, which is perhaps not that nice to read, but it seems to work quite well. And then if you have this kind of cluster where you're running your stuff, uh, it's not immediately obvious how you should turn it to your development environment. And there are different options. Um, which each their own set of caveats and good sides. Um, so there were basically three different options that we thought that could work. Uh, basically being running everything locally on a mini cube or your own Kubernetes cluster or well, not a cluster, a Kubernetes instance because it's a single machine. Um, that's Actually, I have wrong emoji there, but it's not quite like production uh, because uh, 
well, it's running in Kubernetes, but very different cl cluster than you are using. Uh, still probably better than using Docker Compose, though. Feedback cycle could be really well, good with that, because you can mount, for example, your local uh, folders to the Minikube instance or direct them. So uh, there is at least hope that the, your Rails environment could, for example, use auto-reloading uh, seamlessly with that setup. So that's uh, somewhat important for Rails as it's a framework that's quite slow to start, but they work around that by l reloading code when there are changes. The maintenance, however, would be also distributed, so every developer could do whatever they want with the cluster and break it, and no one could monitor if it's up to date or something. And probably as you're running it on your own uh, laptop, your MacBook fans would be screaming at some point because uh, you're running, uh, in our case, maybe 30 services, but uh, that could quite easily grow in the future to be much more. Um, then the second option, uh, a bit more ambitious, that uh, you would run uh, most of the services in the Kubernetes cluster, but then you could take a single se service or maybe a few that you develop to run on your local machine and then uh, <coughs> direct the traffic between or proxy the traffic between your machine and the cluster. So that, that would be uh, basically using telepresence, uh, which is the proxy there, set up there. And it's uh, a bit more like production because all the other services at at are at least running in the uh, Kubernetes environment and it actually uh, takes all the, for example, environment variables that you need for your service from the uh, Kubernetes environment. So it should work quite well in, in that sense. Feedback cycle is perhaps not as fast in general, uh, as you would have something running locally, but at least you can uh, run stuff in your own machine, use the Docker uh, container there. Uh, again, you can mount stuff uh, for your Docker machine. You just have to write a different set of uh, configuration to ha have the volumes mapped and so on. But it's possible and we have done it, done it so that works and it's a bit easier to maintain in the sense that the only thing you need to have locally is the docker machine nice. um, and your macbooks fans are happy or you can use most of the resources on your uh, laptop to do whatever you want instead of running your development environment. So in, in that sense, I think uh, just having a single service is a great improvement to the entire system locally. Then there would be a third option, uh, just like run everything on Kubernetes. There's a tool that helps you with this, which is called Scaffold by Google. So it certainly gets you a very production-like environment. However, the feedback cycle is a bit of unknown. So when we started this, uh, Scaffold didn't uh, support any kind of file synchronization. They added it conveniently like a month or two later when we had already something working. So we didn't I investigate that further, but the, they have basically a system is that you can develop something locally and then Scaffold will either synchronize the files to the cluster or it might push images to a repository so that you then um, run that or uh, update the image on a running container which probably makes sense for Google if they are running, for example, Go-based services where you have to have the compilation step there anyway. 
And in terms of maintenance, that should be a fairly simple solution because you can't even mess up your Docker instance on your Mac because you run out of the 64 gigabits of space that it has available by default. And it's very easy for your um, laptop again, so you don't need much resources to run this system. But so as you might guess, we went with the telepresence setup as it was available at the time. Uh, <clears throat> um, but also partially because it didn't require us to change anything in, in our existing setup. So uh, Google Scaffold basically seems to require Helm if you want to use any kind of templating in your Kubernetes configurations. And we had chosen uh, Shopify's Kubernetes deploy as our uh, Helm-like deployment system. And here's a simple image on like how Kubernetes works, uh, uh, how telepresence works. So it replaces your pod in the cluster uh, with its own proxying pod that takes in all the uh, traffic. Uh, but also then it allows you to um, tunnel or your container networking traffic from your local laptop to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so if you have your, let's say, Rails application running on your laptop in a Docker container and there's a telepresence network set up, then the Rails application can access the uh, Postgres database or whatever databases you have running in the Kubernetes environment. Uh, just like the pod could access from the cluster. So that enables us to have a fairly seamless development experience. Uh, so when we deploy something, what, what's happening there uh, in our setup? So uh, we first of all need to build a Docker image, push it to registry. Um, in development mode, we might need to also create a namespace uh, with a user prefix. So um, if I'm deploying first time a service, then the namespace perhaps doesn't exist or most likely doesn't exist. So we have this schema where it's prefixed by, by each one's identity, which they can choose. In my case, it would be Lautis and then I'd be l running stuff in Lautis service name, for example. And that uh, namespace also needs some uh, configuration uh, for Kubernetes deploy to be able to decrypt secrets. So that needs to be synced uh, when the namespace is created. Um, then during deployment, those secrets must indeed be decrypted in the repo so that you get the correct API tokens and so on available to your application. And uh, as the last step, sync those YAML files from your local repository to remote cluster. And basically, Kubernetes deploy, which we already use, handles the two latter steps rather well. So that we get as a freebie and we can just call that from our own tooling. Um, but we need to have some system that builds the image and creates namespace or prepares the namespace to uh, be able to run the decryption. And the uh, keys we store in one password, uh, so they have a command line client that we can wire up together. So that gets us a dev box deploy command or how it logically works. Uh, having that running, uh, making a deploy all command is not really rocket science. Um, so you basically need to just run the command on each service or repository. Uh, though that might be a extra thing we need to solve. So we needed to also have a devbox pull command, which would clone and pull all Git repositories uh, to your local machine in a uh, 
same directory. And of course, during this uh, deploy all, it was quite uh, quickly obvious that uh, caching was essential. So you don't want to build uh, Docker images for all of your 30 or so services uh, when you first time deploy something. That would be really painful and slow. So having the, these images stored in a remote registry uh, before you do is, is very essential. And then we also can parallelize this process so we can run deployments for multiple services uh, at the same time, which gets us from um, maybe, let's say, 30 minutes of deployment time to uh, three minutes of deployment time for our complete environment from pretty much scratch. And in addition to those things, there is some minor little things that we needed to add. So have some information about pod statuses, uh, an easy way to access logs and so on. And then you get a rather well working dev box. But this is a Ruby meetup. So how would you build this in Ruby? Because that's what we did. Um, we or well, we didn't start with Clamp. We originally built it by hand, thinking that we could make it as a no gem dependency project, uh, which would be nice for uh, distribution. But uh, eventually, it was quite obvious that having a good structure is really helpful, and using Clamp uh, gives us many nice things for free. So the basic functionality is that Clamp passes command line arguments and options and then runs some commands that you defined as uh, in, uh, or subclasses of clamp command. And those can then be built as a subcommand. Sub so like, for example, devbox deploy, or maybe if you're using git, git pull would be a subcommand. Or you could have any number of layers there, uh, but that quickly becomes quite inconvenient but it works. And because Clamp knows of the structure of the application, it can help you if you don't know what you're doing. So you can say dash dash help, and it will print a rather nice looking help uh, output. Unfortunately, man pages are not at least yet generated, but that would be a uh, like ideal situation. No one could complain anymore. Uh, but uh, I would certainly recommend Clamp as a good baseline for building command line applications in Ruby. Um, but basically what, what the devbox tool does is just it executes a lot of shell commands. So it, it wiring those together and that's uh, the glue between one password command line, uh, Docker, uh, occasionally some kubectl or Kubernetes deploy, which we run as a shell command, even if it's a Ruby gem. Um, but that's pretty much most of the functionality. Uh, one thing uh, Ruby is perhaps not ideal is the distribution. So there's not that many popular, popular Ruby applications that you could install, for example, from Homebrew or some other package manager, and it would just work. So the examples are a bit limited on how to distribute this, especially on multiple different systems. Of course, gems would be the obvious choice. Uh, if you have a working Ruby, you can say gem install. Uh, well, Rails has a command line interface, and it works. Uh, there's just a tiny little issue there with uh, something like DevBox. If you are using multiple Ruby versions in your different services, you need to also ensure that you install the client to all of those Ruby versions and keep it up to date to be able to run the command in all directories. <coughs> 
Bandler, Bandler might also uh, interfere with your or prevent the application from calling DevBox in some cases because the Bundler environment ensures that you can only use the specific set of gems available for your uh, application that you define in your gem file. Um, a slightly funnier option at least would be to use Ruby Packer which is a tool that compiles Ruby and your gem or well a, any Ruby application really to a fat binary that contains everything um, which could be great for applications like DevBox um, but there are some caveats so for example file system access is not exactly like you would uh, maybe assume that it is because the application is now a uh, well it's an zip file and then a small piece of uh, code that loads stuff from the zip file so if you need to give references to any file that's in your application bundle or in the fat binary then it most likely won't work in the other application and for example in our case Kubernetes deploy wouldn't work without fairly uh, ugly monkey patches to uh, change stuff and copy files to temp files and uh, overriding paths so that Kubernetes deploy would be happy. So what we chose to use then is homebrew formula. Um, you st start from a Ruby gem in this process. Uh, have a formula that builds and installs gem and its, its dependencies to a separate directory from your usual gem path and then have a wrapper script that just manipulates the environment to include a uh, reference to the uh, gem path that Homebrew chooses to use and this then works regardless of your uh, RVM or R RBN of setup uh, and it always is using your system Ruby or the Ruby that you install via homebrew and as a bonus we can use this mechanism to install also non Ruby dependencies so uh, one password or kubectl and so on and if you're interested in having that kind of setup there are some examples in the homebrew repository so you can for example look at the container command line interface how they are building this kind of stuff uh, of course with homebrew as the default option you could say that Linux support could be better uh, we have few people using uh, Linux or non Mac OS environments Unfortunately, the, most of them are, even among the few people, they are choosing to use very different setups. So it's hard to justify the investment, or at least it doesn't make me very interested in uh, such investment. And you can s still uh, use uh, the DevBox tool, uh, just symlinking stuff, or installing the gem or something like that so it's workable but some manual steps are needed to have it running um, there could be some nice solutions using a tool called FPM which is short for effing package management and that's their uh, choice of or how they spell it out um, but basically it's a Ruby based tool that allows you to build uh, image uh, packages for different operating systems or especially Linux distributions and because it's a Ruby based tool they also support on some level at least building operating system packages from Ruby gems so that could work I have tried to uh, promote that idea to some of the Linux developers but they have not yet been very interested um, but that's something we have working uh, there are some future things we might uh, 
uh, want to use or, or take in use. So it might be nice if you wouldn't have to run the deploy all command on your laptop, but could instruct a service to do that so that it set up, sets up everything. And if there is something to be built uh, or a Docker image that needs to be built, then the service would do that. And it could be a even more um, stable solution for the initial setup. I mentioned Helm and Scaffold earlier, though that could be a more standard replacement for um, Kubernetes deploy and telepresence. But then again, telepresence is working quite well for us, so I'm not sure. I guess it depends more on if we want to move from Kubernetes deploy to Helm at some point. And we would certainly like to open source uh, DevBox. Unfortunately, there are some um, smart specific things in the code base still, which we would need to figure out how to have somewhere else for the open sourcing to make sense. And this, or we probably should uh, try to run um, DevBox against some public uh, Kubernetes cluster like Google Cloud uh, instead of just our own to see if there's something we have missed in the process. That might also be helpful because the setup does have one caveat right now. It is uh, surprisingly slow if you're not in Finland because then the round trip between database and your service running on your local laptop grows. So that's something to take in consideration that telepresence might not be op optimal if you uh, are not located close to the Kubernetes cluster or especially need to de develop uh, all around the world your application. And I have a, or I can show you a bit on how this works. Maybe if I get the. So if I would be using DevBox, probably the first thing I would do is to uh, pull all the repositories and see if there are any updates. And there probably were not that many. Uh, it doesn't uh, check out or change the branch if you are in some other branch that than the uh, master branch. So for example here, the smart UI and smart v1 repositories were not uh, pulled, but all the others were updated. Um, then let's say if Uh, to deploy a service, I have actually deleted this one, so it now says that nothing is found. So let's deploy that because I'm creating the namespace. I need to get secrets from one password. If the namespace is not being created, that's not required. Then it uh, outputs a fair amount of stuff to my screen. Now it's waiting that Kubernetes acknowledges that the uh, process called web or deployment called web is running. Now it got confirmation that everything is there. So we can test again whether the service responds with something. And now it does say uh, invalid batch, which is uh, expected because I just made a dummy call, but th that's something to, or how, how we can get a individual service updated. Um, since that worked quite well, now I can feel adventurous and try to update all my projects. So that would uh, look which projects are not being updated, which in this case a project called Distillery has had some changes in the past 
I don't know, three hours. And that probably takes a bit longer to run than my example deployment, but should do the exactly same thing and end up in a consistent state. And now that I have the environment running, why is my then I can access the development environment in my own subdomain. Oh nice, our CSS bug is back or we are not loading any CSS. And I don't remember my password. That's going to be maybe I destroyed the environment at some point. Image password. <laughs> it could be because I, it's. I tried. Uh, you mentioned it was one password. <laughs> it has a hint that it's password, so that, that's a good. Capital P. <laughs> at one. No, it's not. Well, I could create. That might be. <laughs> Unfortunately, our sign up process is a bit um, complicated because, um, well, there's no other authentication in the development cluster, so please don't use this um, uh, against us. But basically, if we had the sign up open, thank you. If we had the sign up open, <laughs> oh no. What? What is this? <laughs> Yeah, these security things are always yeah. annoying. <laughs> and now it's loading my development instance, but of course it would, doesn't have any data because that's removed. And then, it, I'm, well, I could demonstrate smartly, but I'm not sure how many of you would be interested in uh, having a <coughs> quick demo about Facebook uh, ad automation. But that's... We are also hiring, so if you're interested in uh, building Facebook ad automation or maybe uh, the tools that helps others to build Facebook ad automation, we would be interested in talking to you. But that's pretty much or how you could work with DevBox or get stuff running and have a complete independent uh, environment which is pretty much like having a staging for each developer. And there's an amazing testimonial by one consultant that was working for us uh, <laughs> that it's amazing that now my MacBook charges its battery when it's plugged in, which wasn't the case with the previous setup. So uh, there was a limit to his working day length. Uh, at which point he just couldn't do stuff because he was out of battery and plugging it in wouldn't help. <laughs> 